So let's go local now and try and, and get a New South Wales perspective from the Secretary of the, the Ministry, um, Dr Mary Foley. Firstly, thank you for the introduction, Norman. I'd like to acknowledge Melinda Pavey, Parliamentary Secretary for Health. I'd like to thank uh, Alan Madden for his uh, very warm, warm welcome to country. And I was reflecting while he was speaking that I was born on Gadigal land and have lived and worked most of my life on Gadigal land. And it's a great privilege to, to do so and to be here today, friends and, and colleagues. The theme of, uh, of this year's health uh, symposium is, sustain is sustainability. And uh, I'd like to open with some reflections about what that means. When we talk about health system sustainability, we're recognising the challenges involved that New South Wales health system, like all health systems around Australia and globally, face in ensuring a sustainable, effective healthcare services are available to our communities. Some people raise the issue of healthcare sustainability to suggest that, that we're all going to hell in a handbasket, whatever that expression means, uh, a, a suggestion that, uh, that there's something fundamentally wrong with health systems and, and that we won't be able to keep them going in the future to serve our communities in the way they may have done in the past. I certainly don't subscribe to that view. If one reflects, uh, health systems are constantly evolving and responding. Uh, if you think about it, we're not delivering services in the same way that we did even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago or 30 years ago. In fact, if we were, going back to how we did it 30 or 40 years ago, we would need a hospital on every corner with extremely long lengths of stay, outmoded care models, and much poorer patient outcomes. Just a few reflections can bring it home that if, if we'd been thinking back then and extrapolating out how many hospital beds you need or, or, or what sort of services you need, we would have been saying the same thing. This, this isn't sustainable. For instance, the survival rate for many common cancers now has increased by 30% uh, in the past two decades, and of course this goes hand in hand with cancer now being regarded more as a chronic disease for management over time and with treatment largely on an ambulatory basis. Or if you take AIDS-related deaths, they've fallen dramatically in New South Wales and elsewhere because of effective HIV treatment. And international research shows that the lifespan of people living with HIV is now not much different from the average population life expectancy, a fantastic change in outcome. If you go back a couple of decades, uh, it was all when the AIDS crisis and epidemic first broke, uh, and St Vincent's campus that I know well, it was all about the hospice. It was all about managing people with terrible illness and dying. It's, it's a very different story there now. So health systems do evolve. They need to evolve. They evolve in response to the new technologies that develop as well as the changing community needs that need to be met. Also in terms of this question of sustainability, that it's not a panic, that as I say, that, that, that it's all going wrong. Uh, I have had the uh, enjoyable um, uh, job on behalf of ARMAC, the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council, of chairing an exercise looking at the productivity question. We've, productivity generally in government is the new black. Um, everything's being looked at at a productivity lens. And uh, so we were looking at an exercise where those of us in health could translate ourselves to talk to those who operate in treasury and, and in economic terms. And it's been a very valuable exercise. But as part, so that we could explain the languages we use and put it into, in, and hold our own in, in arguing for, for health resources. But the interesting outcome of that exercise is that, of course, you can observe that health expenditure rises with GDP, and that's because community is regarded as a highly valuable good. As one of the health economists, or one of the economists advising us said, if the economy's improving uh, and people have more wealth across the board and they go and buy lots of flat screen TVs, we think that's a sign of a good thing. Whereas if they want to go and buy more health care and what could be more prized than, than longevity and quality of, uh, of life, then we think it's a problem uh, and a drain on the economy. And far from it. We also in that exercise have done an exercise which will be um, taking to health ministers and, and I think 
you know, be good to be able to promulgate it once we finalised it. But, but doing calculations which, which show, in fact, that um, you can quantify uh, the contribution that health makes, uh, makes to the economy because, of course, um, uh, living longer, having a better quality of life and, and, a, and healthier in, individuals and communities means that our economy is far more productive and we can actually quantify that and quantify how health expenditure can actually produce growth in GDP. So we're going to quite enjoy having those conversations we feel now well equipped to have, have with Treasuries. But it's an important point to make. So our sustainability theme was certainly not about health system in crisis, which is often how uh, tabloid headlines like to talk about health, but it's actually about recognising that it's a constant job to undertake that evolution uh, and, and, that, uh, and that we're all on board and that's why we're all here to do it. Uh, the other reflection, of course, is, is that um, here in Australia and particularly in New South Wales, we have a very good health system. Uh, and I'll just put up this interesting uh, slide from, from, from BHI, but just to reflect, our health outcomes are good. In 2012, life expectancy at birth for New South Wales residents was 79.9 years for all of you men here and 84.2 years for all of you women here. New South Wales residents have a positive view of their health status uh, from various surveys with 82.4% rating their health as good or better in 2012. And of course, more recently, the results from the 2013 patient survey conducted by the Bureau of Health Information shows that 91% of patients rate the care they receive in our healthcare services, our public healthcare services here in New South Wales, as good or very good. And of course, we rate well on a global scale, and that's what this uh, slide is that I have up here from BHI. Uh, in 2013, uh, they produced this uh, uh, concept in one of their reports where they considered 10 similar jurisdictions, including amongst others, Sweden, Germany, the UK, US and New Zealand, and concluded, looking at quality and cost measures, that no other jurisdiction had lower spending and better health outcomes than New South Wales. Not that we are complacent, of course, uh, and there is no doubt that ourselves and all health systems are at a major inflection point to define health systems fit for purpose for the 21st century. And of course, it's not to under underestimate the challenges that we face. Uh, this is, and you don't have to read it all, but, but this gives us a, 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 the network of themes that, that emerge when we were consulting uh, and holding various workshops and forums around the state health plan, which the minister launched this morning. And these are the issues that came out of our processes, but also if you went and had the same conversations anywhere in the globe, you would be hearing uh, the same issues. Uh, the challenges of ageing, the challenges around chronic disease management requiring different service models from the ones we've had for the last 20 or 30 years, uh, the problems and issues of access, rising community uh, expectations, new technologies and so on. But to my mind, and in certainly in, in the thinking that's emerged, uh, uh, working with everyone uh, around the system and where we've been placing our energies, th these can be encapsulated in, in three key areas of, of challenge which we're seeking to address. Uh, the, fir the first of those is, quite simply, increasing demand. But that increasing demand is that uh, w there's more and more good things we can do for people and how do we incorporate that into our systems and ensure that we, and ensure that we deliver them. The second is that there is uh, no doubt that there is great scope to improve quality and, and to reduce cost by looking at those areas of waste and duplication and unwarranted clinical variation in our system. And thirdly, the criticality that's emerging worldwide of the need to join the dots for the patient and the imperative of what we're here in New South Wales calling integrated care. And I'd like to say a little bit about each of those three things to, to illustrate. Firstly, this is a, a report from the Grattan Institute, which did a very helpful report last year looking at the major areas of pressure uh, on uh, governments in Australia, state and federal governments combined, and showed that by far, the uh, um, 
pressure on, on government budgets and the future pressure, health beats everything else by far in terms of extrapolating uh, the demand. But they also broke it up to show that, yes, ageing is important, yes, uh, that health has a higher cost inflation than, than the gen general inflation is important, and of course population growth is important. But by far the biggest driver of costs, and it takes the, the costs of health systems and the growth in health systems beyond the growth in, in GDP, is actually this issue that we can do more things for people due to developments in medical technology and new, treat, new and effective treatments. And to turn that into human and patient terms, it, and also, it's not just about ageing, it's about across the continuum, it's about all ages. And it, it, to give that reality, just think about um, children born with cystic fibrosis. Once the prognosis for them was that they, they would not survive childhood. We're now able to support them to survive childhood and adolescence and get to young adulthood and then hopefully uh, be able to have a lung transplant and then have a productive and fulfilling adult life. Uh, if you look at the other end of the age spectrum, uh, for elderly people, uh, elderly people have the prospect to live longer, uh, to live well, to have mobility that uh, um, a generation ago they couldn't have. All of these are real and tangible benefits. There are just so many good things, more and more every day, that we can do. This uh, graph, which is really a, a sort of, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not mathematically derived, it's conceptually derived, but I think it puts some of this together quite well. Uh, it shows um, uh, the benefit of investment in health in quality of adju adjusted life years uh, on one axis and increasing cost on the other axis and looks at the, uh, the huge value that comes firstly from early intervention and prevention through to routine treatments and interventions, and then at the other end, the elements of, of, uh, of waste and, um, and uh, um, adverse outcomes and, and the costs of those uh, in our system. And, uh, and so that second point of reducing clinical variation, uh, addressing race is critical. Uh, it's estimated, and I'm, I'm quoting here, for instance, that in the US, but of course we've got to remember they, they have a much bigger health spend than ours, that up to, it's estimated that up to uh, one third of, of the uh, over 2,000 billion spent annually on healthcare in that country is lost on unnecessary hospitalizations, unneeded and often redundant tests, unproven tre treatments, uh, overpriced drugs uh, and procedures and devices, uh, and uh, inadequate end of uh, life care. Um, and while, as I say, in the United States, that their cost is, is, is so much higher, we all know in our system there are these elements uh, to be addressed. And, and so it's a, it's a two-sided thing of how do we uh, continue to afford and be able to deliver the benefits uh, of, uh, of what all that... Uh, evidence-based uh, development of healthcare through that research investment that uh, Christine was talking about, uh, how we can deliver that at the same time as we eliminate those other elements from our system. And that, that third uh, uh, focus uh, is again a global one, if you, whether you go to the United States and look at uh, the integrated care initiatives within Obamacare, whether you go and talk to Jeremy Hunt, the Secretary of Health in the UK for the NHS, and talk about the priorities within that system or all other systems in between. Uh, everyone is looking at how to uh, integrate healthcare, recognising that uh, we particularly need to bridge that divide that is traditionally there in the healthcare systems we've built in the second half of the 20th century between acute and primary care settings. Whether uh, whatever funding system you have or structural models you have, uh, these two settings tend to be like oil and water and don't come together very easily. Uh, in the Australian system, as Christine was illustrating, 
that, that is further exacerbated uh, in terms of the, the mix of those two, two uh, settings between public and private and not-for-profit sectors and between Commonwealth and, and state governments in terms of funding and sphere of policy influence. And uh, as uh, Christine's uh, spaghetti diagram illustrated, this means that the provision of healthcare services in Australia and achieving integration is, is anything but simple. Uh, in considering this context, there's particular challenges for us at the state level, and at which, we're, which we're embracing and, see, and, and endeavouring to, to address in a constructive way, particularly with the uh, $120 million investment we've committed over four years around integrated care. Because state health systems, which often surprises people both within and without them when, when I say this, if you use dollars as a proxy for the extent of the Australian healthcare system across all its domains, state health systems actually represent less than half of all the Australian health spend and therefore half, less than half of the Australian health system. But the community actually looks to the state public healthcare systems to ensure that services are there when needed. Uh, we do the heavy lifting. We're, we're the ones that people can resort to, whether it is the right care at the right place and the right time or not. And of course, we, we uh, for most of our services, don't charge at the point of delivery. So, uh, so while there has been a bias in, in health system models towards the uh, acute system and the hospital setting generally, um, we even face greater demand pressures because of, of that role we have of, in fact, being the only part of the Australian healthcare system which is actually organised as a system. It's quite remarkable when you re think about it, really. For, for the over 7 million people of New South Wales, our job, collectively, here today, all of us here today, uh, is that to any point within those borders that we have a, a wonderful uh, ambulance and medical retrieval system that can get to you if you're in trouble, hopefully stabilise you, uh, get you out of where you are, bring you to the right level of care, whether that's in a metropolitan hospital or a major uh, base hospital in a, in a major uh, rural town, uh, hopefully save your life, fix you up, put you back together, get you back to a hospital uh, closer to home if that's what's needed, and then discharge you home, and that's where we start to find it a bit harder. We've, we've got some services we can offer you to help to support you if you need support at that point, but that's when we start to need to interact with all those other providers of healthcare uh, services in, in the community, and how we actually manage to do that is, is what, and, and how we design that is what our integrated care strategy uh, is all about. The minister went through the key features of the state health plan and we've got copies here for you all, both the short version and the long version, and I'd encourage you to, to take those with you. But just to rehearse, it, it, the plan is really, after all those consultations, informations and complexities and ways you can describe all these issues, uh, have been distilled down to, to three key areas of focus for us. The first two are really state health core business uh, and have historically been so and are the two areas where there are clear and explicit uh, goals and directions in the government's New South Wales 2021 plan which has been in place for the last three years uh, because it is all about keeping people, people healthy and out of hospital and that goes to the traditional role of the states in, in public health, in, in immunisation, in various community uh, uh, health interventions as well as uh, the provision of high quality, accessible clinical services to our local communities across the board, um, with a focus on hospitals, but also on a whole host of other and associated services, and ensuring that we get the best possible outcomes from those services, our two core areas of business. Uh, and what we've added to that, a third core area of business uh, at the state level, and that is creating a more connected health system across the primary and acute settings that will not only improve patient outcomes, but help reduce unnecessary hospitalisations and emergency department presentations and create a more sustainable system for the future. Sustainable not just financially, but sustainable in that it's fit for purpose and delivering very good outcomes for patients. Uh, and so that's quite, quite a, a strong statement. There were some who thought uh, immediately following the announcements of the federal budget and some of the challenges that 
presents for states in, in the longer term, that uh, th this would be something that would perhaps become of second order importance. But it's actually, uh, and what our plan is saying, it's absolutely of first order importance and the uh, prospects of the, the future discussions, negotiations around Commonwealth state roles and fundings means we have to be even clearer about how we mobile all health resources, whether they're Commonwealth funded, state funded or privately funded around the patient to, to not duplicate, to join the dots and to get the best possible outcomes. And of course, though, those three key areas are, are, are supported by four um, key enabling areas and, uh, and I'm not going to go through, through each of those, uh, but, but uh, we do have uh, other reports and documents about those and also importantly, the plan provides a framework for a whole raft of plans we have across a whole range of areas uh, and provides the coherent framework within which those, those plans sit. Um, in addition, we're also anticipating later in the year the release of the Rural Health Plan, and I'd like to acknowledge Melinda Pavey, who's here with us today, who's the co-chair of that exercise. Uh, the Strategic Health Plan for Children, Young People and Families in New South Wales, which is being led uh, by kids and families. And uh, the whole of government response to the Mental Health Strategic Plan developed by the Mental Health Commission, and we have John Fenley joining us today, uh, which will, will uh, develop the key strategies in that very important area of health care delivery. I thought I'd just say a few things about the Commonwealth budget from the New South Wales health point of view in terms of how it impacts on, on where we're trying to go in our, in our own uh, reform journey. Christine has, has very ably given a comprehensive uh, presentation uh, about the ups and downs and ins and outs of that. But I thought I'd show it to you as to what it means from a health financing point of view and what we faced in thinking about the challenges of the health budget here uh, when those announcements were made in May. Because um, you know, what does it mean when we, when we say that the uh, growth guarantee has been removed. Sorry, I'm just trying to see it so I can see the slide. Uh, the, the growth guarantee has been removed. Uh, what, what, in fact, does that mean? Um, clearly, uh, we're back to the drawing board about how we design the relative contributions of Commonwealth and state and how the fiscal arrangements work between Commonwealth and state to support uh, the various elements of healthcare. Um, the Commonwealth has walked away from uh, the full extent of the growth commitments the, that were in, in that agreement, with the growth guarantee is gone. Uh, and of course, uh, as Christine indicated, we're on notice over the next three years, to, and I'm sure we in New South Wales will be actively involved in this space, about the Federation and tax white papers and, and a new way of putting all of this together. I just thought I'd present uh, this series of three diagrams to just give a simple explanation of what it, what it means. This is actually, we, I pulled this out, a, a diagram we designed at the time we were negotiating the National Health Reform Agreement to show how it would work in terms of the growth guarantees with the Commonwealth meeting 45% of an efficient price for both ABF and block funded in scope services. And then on top of that, even if we didn't have that expenditure on those services, um, uh, or incur those patient volumes, a growth guarantee of Commonwealth funding, the notion of which would, it would at a minimum help to substitute for terminating MPAs, uh, and if the NPAs were continued, it would provide states with that very important resource to invest more I in the new and innovative spaces that we need to be in, while on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to continue to do that heavy lifting and meeting that acute demand of those huge numbers of emergency department attendances, hospital admissions, and so on. So those first two years there uh, show the two years we're just finishing, which you might, for those of you who've attended all the forums we've had about activity-based funding and our new funding model, that's the two transition years we've just completed where the Commonwealth was committed to pay its special purpose payment block payment but started paying it in the form of uh, ABF to, so we could all get ready for uh, next year when they commenced to pay for growth uh, in um, spending and patient volumes in public hospital systems at 45% of the national efficient price. What happens next is the next three years shows um, uh, what's now um, 
we have and don't have under the changed arrangements. The Commonwealth is going to, to continue to be committed to that 45% contribution, and, uh, and that's the pink bit on top of the blue bit. The blue bit's the underlying uh, SPP level of funding. But what's gone are the green bits, which was the funding guarantee over and above that, that if we didn't reach those levels, um, we would still have that additional funding. And those dollar amounts are the, the quantum of that growth guarantee that we, that we were looking to. So essentially the green bits have gone, but we have got the growth guarantee. And, and those pink bits are just estimates. So, so if our growth uh, in our health budget, that we buy both more ABF and block funded services and invest at the state level and develop new services, then the Commonwealth is still for the next three years on the hook to meet 45 per cent of that growth um, on in scope, what are called in scope services. And then, of course, after that, all bets are off uh, and it'll be what comes out of that process of white papers as to what it looks like because then we're really getting down closer to the, the blue bits and if you extended that out, it looks like the diagram that Christine showed that's from the state um, papers, which if, if you do that and nothing else and extra extrapolate out to, to um, 2050, then the Commonwealth proportion really reduces to a very low level of only about 13% of the spend. But clearly the signals about the white papers on, on tax and on um, uh, the federation and the various roles of the levels of government, two levels of government, means that you know, something will need to be done in that space that actually addresses uh, how the fiscal flows work as well as who does what. So that's all I'm going to say about the federal budget. Um, I hope that sort of clarifies some of what you've been hearing. The state budget, of course, came down on, uh, on Tuesday and... Uh, and we were very pleased to be able to um, sustain the, um, uh, the growth envelope that we've been working with for the last couple of years, which uh, allows us to have a discipline on our costs using activity-based funding to provide benchmarks for, for, for what is an appropriate cost, but at the same time providing for growth and acknowledging the growth pressures on our system. So as the Minister said, we now have an 18.7 billion dollar budget and that represents a like-for-like -like increase on last year of 5.2 per cent. Um, and also last year we had a 5.2 per cent increase. That allows us to do a number of things. That 5.2 per cent increase equates to almost a billion dollars. It's, it's, it's a bit over 900 million dollars. Uh, almost half of it goes in cost indexation, salaries and wages and goods and services cost indexation, but the other half is available to buy new services. And of that, we take the biggest chunk, 300 million, and that just goes into our purchasing model to buy uh, or pay for across our districts and networks more ED attendances, more hospital admissions, more um, outpatient services. It includes a significant uh, growth of $27 million in mental health. In addition, uh, it also, um, the second point, uh, we've plugged the gap in the 220 million of uh, further terminating NPAs. It means that critical subacute and other services, and again, in mental health is a good example, we had a large number of new models of care coming online there with the subacute models in mental health that we're able to, to um, um, sustain and uh, extend those. In fact, you might have seen some reporting from the AMA and, and they've now, um, um, you know, they, we've met and taken them through the numbers and, and so they understand, but in terms of their immediate response to the budget, they, they were reading it that, yes, we had a 5.2% increase, but then if we were meeting the $220 million shortfall of those two major terminating NPAs, that that means the growth is not very much at all, but that's not the case. The five po we have the 220 is in our base and, and New South Wales uh, government in the budget has found that 220 from state sources and then on top of that we've got the 5.2. So in fact if you're going to add the NPA um, plugging the gap money on top then effectively it's a 7% increase. Um, there's a substantial boost in, in capital work spending and a whole raft of, uh, of um, other enhancements, many of which the, the Minister outlined. We've also further refined our, mod uh, our uh, funding model, um, which um, is uh, um, something that's now been in place for, for two years. And 
and it's become so much sort of the way we do things and I think become rapidly embedded because it does support a whole lot of the things we're trying to achieve. It's hard to believe that it's only been there for two years, but we have, it has gone through steady refinement. So this is the third budget we've allocated on this basis. We've had a process during the course of the year working with the local health district input to, to refine the model. Um, a number of key refinements are that now that um, now that we've actually, uh, in the two transition years, improved the data, um, extended the, the scope and range of activity-based funding, uh, and therefore its uh, um, coding has improved and so on, um, we're now at a position where, where we can introduce more of the rigours of the model. Um, on the upside for, for those districts and networks which are at or below the average cost, growth will be purchased at 100% of, of, uh, of the state price, which uh, acknowledges and supports uh, uh, the rigour of their performance. Uh, transition grants, which we introduced initially where there was a gap between the average price and the price of a particular district, have been coming down of their own accord, both through better coding and efficiency. But this year also, uh, we're requiring those districts that still have transition grants in the well-established areas of ED and admitted patients to, to start to use some of that towards also paying for more patients and more services. And we further refined uh, how we determine the quantum of growth we purchase from each district um, and network using very strongly population factors. So it's not just about driving volume for volume stake, it's also looking at po population characteristics and, uh, and needs. Uh, and, uh, and of course, with our, with our devolved model, uh, districts and networks uh, have the flexibility to, to move between admitted and non-admitted uh, and community spaces in, in, in the uh, allocation of, uh, of their funding. To look at our own reform journey, because a lot of focus, we had a lot of questions when the federal budget was announced, was this mean activity-based funding's off or does this mean we, we you know, fundamentally challenges where we are? Uh, and, and the strong message I hope today is, is that it doesn't, it raises factors we need to, to deal with. Uh, but, but the issue is we've been pursuing here in New South Wales uh, our, our own um, journey to develop our, the health system we need for the 21st century to, to meet the needs of patients and to meet the needs of our community. Uh, it's had some very clear parameters. It's been about that very strong message of devolution of governance structures, which, yes, were reinforced by the national reform directions, but actually really had grown up in New South Wales as a major direction in response to the findings of, of the Garling Review, which found that significant disconnect between clinicians and, man and management as a, as a major um, malaise and thought within our system that affected the quality and effectiveness of how we deliver care. And, and which people could feel and see came from a disconnect in the, in the previous larger and more remote governance structures in the, in the previous eight area health service model. So, so the, uh, the, the devolved governance structure goes hand in hand and we see as a necessary structural arrangement to be able to get that outcome, you know, the mantra that uh, is used internationally of getting the right people involved in the right, in the right place, uh, the right care, the right time. And you can only do that by placing decision making much closer to where the care is being provided and focused around the patient. Uh, the development of, of, uh, of our um, governing boards that have real authority to govern, uh, devolution of executive authority to the executive structures, and, and even more importantly, strong not just clinical engagement, but uh, empowerment uh, in how we uh, design and, uh, and fund our care, as well as deliver it, have been critical elements of achieving the sorts of reforms that, that we, we need to have to have the health system that we, we all know we want to have. Uh, transparency has been absolutely critical to achieve those things, and, and we've had a major commitment to transparency in this. So. 
Uh, we have gone, as, as you all know, <laughs> two years ago overnight from a historical funding model where the budget was lost in the mist of time in terms of its allocation about because it, it was last year's budget plus or minus adjustments around the edges to one where it's completely transparent and built up for, uh, in terms of uh, connecting the, the dollars paid for, for the, the types of services and the volume of services uh, to be provided. We've also been focusing on those new service models that all health systems are grappling with and we have our pillar agencies, we have very uh, active clin clinician community within all our districts and networks, all working on uh, using the greater transparency of our data, um, the analytic tools that we're making available and during the course of today we've got demonstrations of, uh, of our activity-based management portal which is much more about throwing a light on clinical care as it is on how much it costs, uh, all of those things to, to, to develop the right models of care and of course um, a, a lot of work about uh, and our Clinical Excellence Commission is a great leader in this about uh, safe care, uh, also focusing on supporting innovation, using evidence, supporting research, reducing waste and all those things all focused on, on patient outcomes. That, that's where we've been spending our energies for the last few years. So what next? Where do we go from here? We are going to, and we need to, and the people of New South Wales will hold us accountable to do, to continue to improve our two core businesses, which I say have, have uh, uh, been for almost 100 years, uh, historically, because states only got involved in sort of owning and running public hospital systems in the late 1920s. Uh, in early 30s, um, but had a public health responsibility probably going back to the 1890s. So historically, they're the sort of the two core areas of business of keeping people healthy and, uh, and having a world-class uh, health care delivery system. All of those things we've been talking about and will throughout the day uh, continue to be a major focus. We'll be uh, developing, as our state plan sets out, our focus on integrated care and the signals in the federal budget only make us even more determined that this, this is uh, core to being able to fulfil our responsibilities uh, to the people of New South Wales in terms of our healthcare responsibilities and core to getting it right, to get the right outcome for patients. It does uh, involve uh, working closely, even more closely with primary care, probably even more work now to define the respective roles. We want to influence the arrangements about primary health networks and we want to develop new and effective relationships between EDs and general practice because we already have, as we say, this huge volume of people who come to our emergency departments. For some of those people, it is the best possible place to come, but for others, it's the default place to come because uh, the services just aren't available at that time or, 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 um, or, the, or the right models of care available in the community, whether that's the aged care facility where the patient has a temperature and they're not equipped to deal with them if, they, if the patient you know, goes off a bit over the weekend and can't get a general practitioner to come, uh, call the ambulance and bring them in, bring them in. And of course, uh, then that has a whole lot of other factors that affect that elderly person which can actually through disorientation from, from their, their, their normal um, environment, et cetera, actually do harm at the same time as we make sure that, that, that you know, we're managing their um, emerging illness. Uh, or, we, or whether it's uh, people that, that um, uh, can't, can't get to the GP because they're, they're not well enough or the GP's not available. And again, the default becomes call the ambulance and, uh, and come into the ED. We, we all grapple with these things. Um, so how we actually, and particularly if the co-pays uh, eventuate after the, the legislation goes to the Senate, uh, that's going to be a particular focus area of, of our integrated care program. We're looking forward to the rural health plan, which will have um, significant uh, and practical uh, investments to, to make uh, and, in, and health service improvements to make in how we uh, get those services to rural patients in answer to Brian Pizzuti's question earlier. And of course, what it does do too is document the huge improvements that have happened in rural health care delivery since the last rural health plan, uh, which I think was in 2002. Um, and uh, the, the mental health, we're developing our response on mental health, child and families we've talked about, 
critical in all of this is leadership, and we've made and will continue to make huge investments in, in our leadership capacity and also in, in the enabling strategies outlined in the plan. So to come back to our sustainability theme, our endeavours have been to build the right foundations for a sustainable health system. A lot's been going on over the last few years uh, and uh, our districts and, and, and networks ha ha have a great deal uh, to show in terms of, of uh, how they've embraced the opportunities that hopefully uh, devo devolution and, uh, of governance and, and transparency of, uh, of funding and, and performance ha ha have provided. Uh, but it's not just about um, uh, these um, very technical policy or funding elements. The whole process is one both within our system and between our system and other providers and with the patient about relationships and interactions. It's about understanding how that works and it's about creating an environment and today is part of that where we all can work together to deliver that sustainable healthcare system for the 21st century. Thank you. Probably just one out of time for questions.